On Monday, June 7, 2010, Gary Alibon went to work as usual. He was just eight months away from retirement as a security guard when he was ambushed during a robbery on his cash and transit van. One of the gang shot Gary in the back and left him to die on Sussex Street in the centre of Sydney. This is an appalling crime. Who killed Gary Alibon and why? One million dollars is now on the table for information that leads police to the killers. A good person died for no reason. This is a live police investigation. With your help, I believe we can find the answers to solve Gary's case. Detective Superintendent Deborah Wallace rose to the top of the New South Wales police force with grace, humour and an iconic sense of style. The person that was shot is known to police. In her incredible 37 years in the force... Police search warrant! Wallace took on murderers, drug suppliers and bikey gangs. All cases can be solved. They're never cold. And you never give up. Thank you, Market. Two take one. Thank you. Monica, could you um, introduce yourself? I'm Monica Alibon. I'm the widow of Gary Alibon, who was shot in a robbery gone bad, if that's what you want to call it, on the 7th of June, 2010. And that's the day my life fell apart. That winter's day in 2010 began like any other in the Alibon household, with Monica's husband, Gary, waking before dawn to get ready for work. Gary went to work usually at 10 past four. He had a long way to drive, so he kissed me goodbye, tucked me in, and told me he loved me, which we always did that. That's sort of like a ritual? Was Whenever we left the house. Yeah. yeah. Did, was there any, anything else? I heard that he might have left you, a, like, a note sometimes? He left notes almost every day. Did he? For about 16 years. Good morning, my darling. Have a good day. Enjoy what you're doing. Don't rush home. That kind of stuff. And finish off with I love you. I usually wake up around seven and went downstairs. Turn the television on as I do, and the seven o'clock news was on. First to breaking news, and a man's been shot in the chest in Sydney's CBD this morning. And that's when I heard that there was a robbery. Nine reporter Chloe Bugelli is at the scene and joins me now on the line. Morning, Chloe. What can you tell us? Good morning, Alicia. Well, just after 5.50 this morning, a uh, security uh, guard working for the Chubb security firm was making a, uh, a routine cash drop-off here at the Commonwealth Bank building in Sussex Street when he was approached uh, by a, a man who jumped out of a silver Audi. Now, uh, there was a scuffle and uh, the security guard was shot in the chest. Now, he was rushed to the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital via an ambulance where he remains in Cruz condition this morning. I did a double take and just something inside of me that said, please God, don't let it be him. But it's, I just knew in my heart that it was. Police have blocked off uh, this uh, section of Sussex Street. They're talking to witnesses. There's also quite a few colleagues from the Chubb security firm who have gathered here. So no doubt more information will come to hand throughout the morning, Alicia. Straight away, I rang Chubb security. Nobody answered the phone. I rang five, six times. And then I finally got somebody. I was beside myself by now. 
they said they were going to send somebody. And then I decided, oh, well, I'll wait upstairs. So I went up there and there were three police cars there. And one of the police just came out, grabbed me by the arm, and they said, we need to take you back downstairs. I think they said he didn't make it. I'm not sure what they said. Mm. Just something came over me. I think I almost really started to pass out. We trusted each other. Yeah. And people that know us used to say, like, we'd hold hands walking in the street or in church. And people honestly would say, just the way you looked at each other was enough. Gary was 59 at the time of his yeah. murder. Yeah, he was eight months short of retiring. He was turning 60. And even reading his notes this week, he writes to a different life. So he had plans? We did. Chubb's security guards were still in disbelief. They gathered at the spot where their workmate was fatally shot. It could have been any one of them. Instead, it was 59-year-old Gary Alibon. The murder of Gary Alibon was a massive news story in Sydney because it happened in clear public view. I was driving to work and I heard on the radio that there'd been a shooting in the middle of the city. I got to work and then I started hitting the phones. Then I realised that so uh, very early that it was a cash and transit robbery and that one of the guards had been shot dead. When CCTV of the incident was later released, people were shocked at the recklessness of the armed robbers. At 6am, the robbers clipped a car in a stolen silver Audi before making a U-turn to follow a Chubb security van. The armoured vehicle they were tailing was none other than Gary Alibon's. What emerged was that there was a, a, a payroll, a delivery being done mainly for the ATMs. And it was in Sussex Street, down near Darling Harbour. The van had pulled up, and I believe the guards were in the process of taking the cash canisters out to uh, fill up the ATM. When an Audi pulled up, there were four men with balaclavas. And from there, it sounds like just, you know, something like out of the movies. They were yelling, they were saying, put the F and, you know, canister here, give me the money, get down on the ground. And in those few minutes, uh, Gary Alibon is shot. He wasn't going for his weapon. He had already turned his back on them. There was no threat to any of these guys involved in the robbery, yet he was still shot. This is an appalling crime. We know that Gary was just doing his job. We know that he wasn't a threat to anyone, and uh, we know he ended up dead from this crime. Detective Chief Superintendent Darren Bennett oversees both parts of the investigation, the armed robbery and the murder of Gary Alibon. We can surmise that they definitely knew what they were going to try and steal. In the course of that robbery, the people attempted to steal $300,000 in the canisters that were being used to fill the ATM. They were successful in that, and the offenders got away. These armed robbers were completely ruthless. After shooting Gary Alibon, they rolled him over and took his gun. That was just a, another act of... of of in inhumanity towards a dying man. The murderers made their getaway through the streets of Surrey Hills, overtaking traffic and briefly stopping before running a red light in the stolen Audi. What happened straight after, just two days later, the vehicle that the robbers used with a fake number plate on it was found in the Melpera area burnt out. The torched getaway car was a strong signal to police that they were dealing with an organised gang. And it didn't take them long to link the smoking pile of metal with a criminal enterprise they knew well. And it was found burnt out quite near the Clomanchero Clubhouse in Milpera.
police in Sydney are looking for four men after an armed robbery in the city CBD this morning. A security guard was shot in the chest outside the Commonwealth Bank on Sussex Street. Police, uh, their priority is tracking down that silver Audi. It was last seen travelling south down Sussex Street, a very busy uh, street in Sydney City, so they're tracking that Audi and desperately trying to find out who these men were. Two days after Gary Alibon's murder, the high-performance Audi used by his killers was found torched in Milpera, very close to the headquarters of the Comancheros biker gang. Where did the investigation go from there? Well, it, we, we tried to backtrack uh, what we think took place. This Audi was stolen from a car yard in Rosebury sometime before the offence. It's uh, quite common even now that uh, people will steal high performance cars because they're, they're very quick to get away. They can often elude police chasing them and uh, create very dangerous circumstances. On the morning of the hold-up, the Audi was one of three cars used by the gang on the way to the job. They ran a shuttle, which also involved a white BMW and a silver BMW. They were stolen as well. After the hold-up, the Audi was parked in Kensington, before making its final journey to Milpera two days later. We've used that to try and trace the movements of that vehicle before it was burnt out. We've found that vehicle and another Mercedes following it, going through a toll gate on the M5 just before it was found burnt out. The Mercedes was later made to disappear as well. A pretty common practice in the world of organised crime, where high performance cars are stolen and routinely stashed in warehouses for months on end. They only come out for special occasions, like the hit on Gary Alibon's armoured van in 2010. So they're very, very, very well organised. And there's a whole criminal network. Someone will supply the car, someone will supply the guns. They still have two-way radios in some cases, you know. It was going according to plan until that guy decided to shoot Gary Alibon in the back. The next step for police was to forensically track down the gun used in the murder. Once we have a projectile that uh, has been used in a crime, we'll trace it through our ballistics matching and we'll trace it to other crimes. And that's certainly what's taken place in this case. That gun has been used in other offences. Like boom, 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 and then the car was spitting. Police matched the gun used in the Gary Alibon murder to a terrifying drive-by shooting in Sydney's eastern suburbs in 2007. A two-level mansion with a pool, uninterrupted water views and bullet holes in the garage. Well, certainly it's not something that happens in Vaucluse every day of every week. Shell casings littered across the road, two of the bullets prized from the garage wall. Police soon discovered another match to the same weapon. Good evening. A Sydney crime kingpin and his mate have been gunned down in a targeted attack on a suburban street in Sydney's west. In 2012, infamous drug cook Roy Yagi and a criminal accomplice were gunned down in a hail of bullets in Wentworthville. Their murders were part of a battle for supremacy between rival gangs, including the Comancheros. Both the individuals who have died were known to police, well known to police. People knew exactly what they were doing and, and, and who were um, the intended targets. It wasn't the first time Yagi had been the target. He was wounded in another shooting a few years ago. Bullet casings from the first shooting of Roy Yagi were matched to casings found in the burnt out Audi at Milpera, which meant police now had a tangible link between three shootings. The shooting of a drug cook is linked to the shooting of Gary Alibon and another shooting at Vaucluse.
The police were hot on the evidence trail and it all pointed to the Comancheros outlaw motorcycle gang. We know some of the offenders involved in this matter and those persons will be called before the coroner's court as involved parties. But which offenders or what evidence was presented to the coroner in 2015 is still a mystery. As State Deputy Coroner Magistrate Helen Barry made a non-publication order on the entire brief of evidence. The coroner has referred it back to State Crime for continued investigation and that's an indication from the coroner that they have uh, some confidence that we'll be able to clear this matter up in the fullness of time. The inquest into Gary Alibon's murder may have been shrouded in secrecy, but police have since publicly identified a key person of interest, a Comanchero named Mark Buttle. He's a self-proclaimed commander of the Comancheros. He's He actually appointed himself as the national president. So he doesn't shy away from who he is. He's supposedly an international drug lord, moving a lot of drugs around the world and living a, a very, very, very rich lifestyle. The forensic crumbs left by the killers of Gary Alibon eventually led New South Wales Police to the Comanchera Outlaw Motorcycle Gang and its self-declared president, Mark Buttle. Now, it just so happens I know a few things about Mark Buttle through my work leading Strike Force Raptor, where we had a simple mandate, take down the bikies. I'll come back to that. But first, some context. How did Mark Buttle get involved with the Comancheras in the first place? I'm meeting with author Adam Shand, who spent six years immersing himself in the world of outlaw motorcycle gangs. I want to talk about Mark Buttle. What was his background? Well, he grew up in Maroubra, a bayside suburb of Sydney, eastern suburb. Maroubra is a place where beach culture meets million dollar real estate and housing commission. It's the home of the Bra Boys, a gang of surfers with historic criminal links. Many of the Bra Boys grew up in public housing, alongside Mark Buttle. The thing about the Housing Commission in Maroubra was they were all thrown together. You could go and get a trade and maybe have a decent career, decent life, or you could have a fast, exciting, wealthy life joining the crooks. Mark grew up on the streets and he's like many young kids in that situation, once you get a few juvenile convictions, you're screened out of, out of school and really your ultimate place of advanced learning will be Long Bay Correctional Centre, you know, the College of Knowledge. Buttle was just the kind of fresh blood that the Comancheros were looking for. He joined the outlaw bikers at the age of 21. The one key note with, with Buttle is ambition, a thirst for power. And this is, in fact, the story of the Comancheros from almost the beginning. The Comanchero Outlaw Motorcycle Club was formed on the New South Wales Central Coast in the late 60s by this man, Jock Ross. How important is loyalty to you? Extremely. Loyalty is... Uh the whole essence of everything. But it was an act of disloyalty by some of his gang members who left the Comancheros to join the Bandidos that led to the Mulpera Father's Day Massacre in 1984. Seven people were killed when the rival outlaw gangs had a shootout in the car park of the Viking Tavern. Among the dead, an innocent 15-year-old girl, Leanne Walters. 
Four members of the bikie gang were waiting for the Chief Comanchero when he walked free at 9 o'clock this morning. Ross spent five years in jail for his part in the shooting. But his iron grip on power was challenged by a new wave of Comanchero gang members in the late 90s. Once they began to recruit from jail, uh, we saw the money roll in and we suddenly saw, began to see the Middle Eastern connection. Among the ambitious new recruits was Lebanese-born Mick Howie. He represented a new style of biker, the so-called Nike bikies, where gold chains and designer runners outrated the old-school bikie colours championed by the likes of Jock Ross. And Ross's ridiculous insistence on controlling the lives of everybody uh, was really wearing thin on people like Howie, to the point where Howie and one or two others go up to Ross's house on the Central Coast in 2002 and just beat him up. And what does Ross do? Nothing. So we, we immediately see a real generational change there which in a way sets up the, the next generation, which is Mark Buttle. Buttle saw his chance to claim the throne after a brutal bikey brawl at Sydney Airport in 2009. Good evening. Sydney's bikey gang war hit a horrifying new level today with a deadly attack in full view of the public at the domestic airport. A 28-year-old man believed to be from the Hells Angels gang was bashed to death by more than 15 men thought to be from the Comancheros. He was bashed with a bollard, punched, kicked and stabbed with a pair of scissors. Howie, who'd led the Comancheros unopposed for seven years, was in command of the murderous airport rampage. He handed himself in to police the next day and went straight to jail. With Howie behind bars, Buttle moved quickly to fill the power vacuum. You can't run a bikey club from jail. So he took his chance. He declared himself the leader and he had enough soldiers, some very, very loyal soldiers. Uh, so Howie's forces thought twice about taking him on and they'd rather just live with it that's what happened. Yeah. Do you think Buttle always wanted the top job? Always. So, what's Mark Buttle's link to the murder of Gary Alibon? In 2010, Buttle was leading the Comancheros and police have linked the killing to the outlaw bikies by forensically matching bullets and shell casings found at the scene with other crimes. But that doesn't confirm who was involved in the holdup or who fired the gun and murdered Gary Alibon. One of the state's most notorious bikies has been arrested on the Gold Coast. Instead of sun, sand and surf, Mark Buttle's Queensland holiday will now be behind bars. Buttle was in and out of jail for several years as police went to war with the outlaw biker gangs to take back control of our streets. In a series of raids, police have tightened their big attack on bikey gangs. New South Wales police formed Strike Force Raptor, which I was proud to lead for six years. <laughs> Raptor used a multifaceted approach to smash the bikies there was a primary focus on dismantling their clubhouses and disrupting their national bikey runs. And we were largely successful with these objectives. But in the Gary Alibon murder investigation, police made a strategic move in 2015. They released these CCTV images of two cars going through a toll booth 48 hours after the 2010 shooting. The stolen Audi, used as the getaway car, is the first to pass through the toll booth. 
It's closely followed by the stolen Mercedes, with two men clearly visible in the front seats. When they released the image, police appealed for help in identifying the two men in the Mercedes. The Mercedes that was following the stolen vehicle had two males in it. We're yet to identify those people, so that's certainly a line of inquiry uh, that, we, that we've been following up and will continue to follow up. And soon after the announcement, Mark Buttle made a move of his own. I'm not saying it's exactly the same time, but in 2015, he attempts to leave Australia via Newcastle Airport. Yeah, that's right. He was caught leaving via Newcastle with a large sum of money. Buttle chartered a private plane to fly to Noumea. But when Border Force officers checked his luggage, they discovered $60,000 in undeclared cash. He spent eight weeks in jail for that before walking free and making plans to leave Australia again, this time for good. He left it quite legally here. There was nothing yeah. here to hold him and he's quite free to come back. Buttle never did come back. Not for his father's funeral in 2017, and not even for his mother's funeral in 2018. He paid for a gold casket, but didn't attend the funeral. I couldn't imagine not going to my mother's funeral, but it's clear why Mark Buttle didn't, because he feared being arrested back in Sydney. So Buttle took up residence in Dubai, where he's alleged to be a key part of what's called the Aussie cartel a major international drug dealing business. He can't come home. He couldn't bury his mother probably the way yeah. he wanted to. And he has to look over his shoulder. I'd be surprised if he is very confident about the future at all right now. The world's becoming a much smaller place for Mark Buttle. Back in the late 70s, working at the local council, I was paid in cash every Thursday. These days, we rarely see or use cash. Wages are paid straight into our bank accounts, and most of us use credit cards for everything. But in the world of organised crime, cash is still king. In broad daylight, a Volkswagen Golf pulls up and outbursts a man armed with an assault rifle similar to an SKS. With the weapon aimed at them, the guards get down, while the masked man tries to take one of their guns. This cash in transit robbery in the Sydney suburb of Campsie netted the armed robbers hundreds of thousands of dollars. But not every cash grab goes to plan. Call the police, call the police. These bandits, who terrorised guards outside the Broadway shopping centre, left empty-handed. There is big money in these cash and transit vans. Mm. It's cash. Mm. You don't have the risk of trying to clean it. It's just pure cash. Gary Alibon knew better than anyone the risks involved in being a cash-in-transit guard. And he had been in another robbery a year and a half before then at Haymarket. They were ambushed. They took his gun then, but he was OK. And he said to me, Monica, this is what I do. Yeah. This is what I do. People put yeah. their lives on the line every day. You would know that better than anybody else. And he said, but this is what I do. Every day, every day and any moment you get out of that vehicle, you're a target. Just doing your job. I'm speaking with Noel Blue, a 30-year veteran of the cash in transit industry. You're working in confined spaces uh, with a crew of two or three people. You become very close and you know them just like you would your own family. 
Noel says the key to surviving a hold-up is training. He points to the Campsie robbery as a textbook example. That criminal got the drop on them. They had nothing else to do but comply. They've complied, they've gone to the ground with their face down. If you go down and lay on your back, the criminal will kick you in the face. He doesn't want you to see them, any distinguishing marks, tattoos, scars, or anything about him. So you comply, you hit the ground, and you've got a better chance of surviving. Noel has spoken with Gary Alabon's crew, the ones with him on the day he was murdered. And they told him Gary did exactly what he was trained to do. He would have done that type of job many, many times. He was replenishing an ATM. The ATM was located at Darling Park on Sussex Street. An advance guard, acting independently from Gary's crew, arrived at the location 15 minutes before them to scope out the location for any signs of trouble. He would have been scanning the area for anything that was unusual, out of the ordinary. People moving quickly. He would have been checking walkways, alleyways, entrances, exit points of that job. Then he would have called Gary and the crew in. They arrived and Gary was driving. I believe Gary exited the truck. He took a commanding position. He could see up and down the street. By radio, they've let the person in the back of the truck know it's all clear. The money come out of the truck. For all intentions and purposes, they are safe to do the job. What they didn't know was that a few minutes earlier, the armed robbers had spotted the Chubb van travelling in the opposite direction across the Sydney Harbour Bridge. The robbers waited until the van was well down the road before making their radical move. Keeping the stolen Audi at a safe distance behind the van until the first cash canister was removed from the back of the truck. They don't just stroll in depth. They uh, are shouting, they're swearing, they're violent. The adrenaline's pumping through their bodies. The blood is rushing. They want that money, they want to get away quick. The bandits secured the first cash canister containing $300,000. They wanted more, but the rest of the money was locked inside the van. And if they want to get in the van, they'll do anything they can to get in that van. But this was no ordinary van. It had been customised to prevent anyone from piercing the high-tech armour. On the day when that guard told the criminal, I cannot let you in, he was telling the truth. Now let's go back to that crucial moment when the gang, at least three of them, emerged from the stolen Audi. By then, Gary Alibon was entering the building and as the leader of the crew, he was armed. I believe that uh, someone shouted, get down. He complied. He didn't go for his firearm, didn't touch the firearm. The training you get down to the minute detail, it would suggest there's no way Gary would have put up resistance. No, Gary had turned around to get down onto the ground. Uh, I believe he was getting down, face down, when he was shot through the trunk of the body. As this CCTV shows, one of the bandits then took Gary's firearm as he lay dying. Noel is convinced the trigger man was an amateur. Anybody on that day could have been shot. And from the photos that you have on the table here, Deb, those two guys there, they're just waving that weapon around willy-nilly, like they're in a movie. They've had no formal training. Mm. That's dangerous. This is Gary just doing his job on the day, a good, decent Australian man, and um, his life was taken from him. We're examining the 2010 murder of cash-in transit guard Gary Alibon. And for some expert analysis of the case, I'm bringing in my former colleague, Wayne Hayes.
what stands out for you about this case? Yeah, this one's a, a very interesting case. Um, the things that stand out to me, there's uh, two aspects of this. The first is the armed robbery, which clearly it was, OK? That's planned. Wayne believes the gang would have surveilled their targets to determine the routes and drop points in advance. And they would have known the protocols for each of the security guards. It's also winter. I think it's relevant. Because it's dark and cold, people are unlikely to be about as much as they would be in the height of summer. The armed robbery was very well planned. That's not in dispute. But what about the murder? Wayne believes that was totally unplanned. Money can be replaced. Human beings cannot be replaced. Plus, it escalates the crime enormously. It's gone from an armed robbery, which I think carries about 25 years, it's gone to a murder which carries life. Why do you shoot a guy in the back who seems to pose no threat to you at all? I think that's a rush of blood. I think that's a steroid brain talking. It was a monumental, stupid thing to do. And I think they'll ultimately pay for it. In 2016, New South Wales Police Detective Inspector Adam Bird went on the record about the Gary Alibon murder. And soon after, Mark Buttle left Australia. We are very confident that we know the names of the four offenders. Top of Inspector Bird's list is Mark Buttle. Living in exile, but still fighting hard to maintain his position as the self-declared leader of the Comancheros. There's Buttle overseas. He has to be lucky every single day. There's always someone who wants to take over, but how does he keep them loyal? And the key to loyalty to Buttle has been money. I've heard that he pays some of his crew here, $5,000 a week, some of them, to do his bidding. An encrypted message to a certain person here, somebody will end up badly hurt or disappear. And that still gives him power here, even though it's very remote. Majid Hamzi, the sibling of Brothers for Life founder, Basim Hamzi, was gunned down this morning outside his Condell Park home. Disbelief as loved ones learn of an early morning execution. Sydney father Majid Hamzi was fired at several times. Mark Buddle has been linked to the 2020 murder of organised crime boss Mijid Hamzi. Police believe that Buddle ordered the hit from overseas after he accused Hamzi of stealing a 400 kilogram shipment of cocaine into Australia. Majid has kept a lower profile than his brother, but last year had cocaine trafficking charges against him dropped. Buddle had earlier allegedly proclaimed to the underworld that he wanted to control the supply and distribution of all drugs coming into Sydney. If you believe this memo, he's basically trying to set himself up as the head of, of all the drug trade. It's made some ripples in the underworld. Some of the people thinking, well, what's he, what's he really, you know, he's trying to take over their business. It's yet another reason why police are keen to bring Mark Buttle out of exile. And the fact that he's prepared to uh, blow his cover by getting into fights with drunken English tourists yeah. in Dubai shows we're not dealing with Al Capone. This video from 2021 was shot at an upmarket Dubai beachside restaurant. It shows a bare-chested and clearly agitated Mark Buttle shooing off a group of English tourists who had reportedly made a pass at his wife, Mel Tewisha, who is also seen in the video. Mel Tewisha has since returned to Australia with a child she had with Buttle. I know that um, police have also put pressure on his wife's family on their business, which is alleged to have been involved in certain aspects of Buttle's business. So police are choking off all the avenues around him and his days are numbered on the run.
police in Sydney are looking for four men after an armed robbery in the city CBD this morning. Police investigating the 2010 murder of Gary Alibon have one key person of interest they want to talk to, the exiled leader of the Comancheros biker gang, Mark Buttle. We're still not there. We're still building a brief of evidence on this matter. We're still undertaking inquiries about more broadly Mark Buttle and any criminal associations he has. Police are also keen to talk to this man, Mark O'Coffin, a long-time criminal associate of Mark Buttle. He is also overseas, on the run from police. Coffin is a tech expert and a former member of the Comancheros, who's believed to have bought the Australasian rights to an encrypted communication network used by criminals. Police are still trying to crack the code on the cipher messaging network promoted by Marco Coffin. However, there's been a significant breakthrough on another encryption network used by the drug lords. Today, we learnt of Operation Ironside, a secret three-year multinational mission to trick the world's most powerful criminals into exposing their own secrets. Flashbang grenades detonated as police move in. And a global takedown is well underway. Operation Ironside was run by the Australian Federal Police and the FBI. They set up a messaging app called Anom and convinced hundreds of drug peddling criminals to use it. The criminals were not underneath the radar. They were on it. Ironside caused the walls to start closing in on Mark Buttle. He was forced to flee from Dubai and has since been traced to Turkey, Iraq, Lebanon and northern Cyprus. One newspaper reported an encounter between Cypriot police and Buttle's entourage of outlaws. Shots were reportedly fired across the bow of his boat before he was detained and released. Australian Federal Police are watching and waiting. No doubt they have some sources of information. They're monitoring his movements and waiting for the best time to grab him. Of course, you've got to find a place where there's an extradition treaty. That's the other part of it. Life ain't great for Mark Buttle now, I wouldn't have thought. Yeah. Whether it's the murder of Gary Alibon or a number of other circumstances, the net is certainly closing on him. Oh, yeah. And he knows it, I'm sure. I mean, he's got a massive price on his head too. Rumours from the underworld indicate there is a $7 million contract out for Mark Buttle. It could be from the Hamsey family or from forces loyal to his old Comanchero boss, Mick Howie. You think you've served more time than you should have for this? Are you still a member of the Comancheros? In 2015, Mick Howie was released from jail for his part in the Sydney airport bikey brawl. Three years later, he was dead. He was coming out of a gym and uh, hopped in his black Mercedes and, and was shot several times. Gunshots rang out and Mick Howie, seated in his Mercedes, was ambushed by an assassin dressed in black. No one's ever been convicted over the hit on Howie, but one name that keeps popping up is Mark Buttle, the protege who stole Howie's crown. But I think you have to see this in relation to that broader clash with Mark Buttle and, and the riches and the control of the club uh, and how he was probably deemed to be expendable. It's always easier to kill a problem than solve it. In the violent world of gangs, life is the cheapest commodity. Mark Buttle must be wondering who will get him first, the criminals or the cops. Either way, New South Wales Police have recently provided an extra incentive to solve the murder of Gary Alibon. One million dollars is now on the table for information that leads police to the killers. Now is the time for you to come forward. If you come forward, 
With this information, I can assure you that your safety and security will be paramount. What piece of the puzzle do you specifically would like assistance on at this stage? Well, we'd like to know who the two males are in the Mercedes that's following the stolen vehicle prior to it being burnt out. We're very interested in who those people are. We know that people out there would know who they are. These friendships are fast and they do all, always fall apart. And the, the thing about bikey clubs is they're always swearing fealty and loyalty and brotherhood, but boy, in some clubs, they can't wait to give each other up uh, under pressure. And when there's a million dollars, I think that's going to be a very tempting lure for some people. Have a conscience and trying to help somebody else, not just me. Gary needs to be rewarded for what he went through for no reason. A good person died for no reason. I've made this request so many times. Mm. Please, have a heart. Listen to your heart. Be honest with yourself.